Um, and welcome. Thank you all for attending. This is our first virtual um, Dive into Disabilities Disability Awareness Club Q&A panel discussion. Um, we have a, a great group of students here from the club that are brave and um, brave and willing to talk about their disability, how it impacts their life, how it impacts their school, and, and answer any other questions that um, may, that other people might be curious about. So I give them a lot of credit. Um, and then we also have Mackenzie or Mac Maher, who's going to take over and moderate for us. So I'm going to pass over the wheels to him. Can I ask a question? Go for it. Yeah. If we have a question, I noticed there's a little hand button there. Are you guys honoring that? Yep. Okie dokie. All right, well, I'm going to echo what Patrick said. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we're going to dive right in with Esley first. Um, so, Esley, my first question for you is, do you know uh, if there is a cure for retinitis pigmentosa? Actually, can we start with, uh, well, if everyone's comfortable with introducing ourselves and then saying our disability? Yes. yes. My bad. It's okay. Sorry. Um, so my name is Esley, Esley Ramos, and my disability is called retinitis pigmentosa, and it's a visual where I can only see um, on, the, on the peripheral, and I, uh, I can't see in the center, and I can only see in certain spots, um, and then the light, um, the light does help me, but at the same time, uh, I'm sensitive to the light. Uh, my eyes are sensitive to the light. So yeah, um, that is pretty much it. And can you repeat the question? Um, I will once everyone finishes themselves. Okay, I didn't know if you wanted to do that or just when they first start the question. Go ahead. Uh, who's next? Erica? Okay, so hi, my name is Eric Knerchak. I'm the Vice President of the Disability Awareness Club, and uh, my disability is that I had a stroke uh, when I was, uh, was diagnosed with it when I was two days born, and as a result of that, I have a visual impairment called hanonymous hemianopsia, which is where I cannot see on the left side of both of my eyes. I think... The next person would be me. I'm Sarah. I'm the secretary, and I have neurofibromatosis two. Uh, no, neurofibromatosis one, also known as NF one. Uh, Juan, you. Um, my name is Juan Zabala. I'm 23 years old. Um, and um, I have uh, um CP, which um, which means cerebral palsy, uh, the, the, the third stage. And what I mean about the third stage is that I use my uh, wheelchair for um, the most of my day. And then is Otis there? Yes, Otis is there. Otis. Uh, hey, what's, what's going on, guys? Sorry, sorry. I had to, I had to get the microphone situated. Had to get the microphone situated. I'm sorry. What? Okay, go ahead. Introduce yourself, um, and then if you feel comfortable, say your disability. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Mm, so, so for those of you who don't know me, hello, everyone. My name is um, Otis Seabury Jr. and um, I'm a general. I'm a general member for a disability awareness club. You know, Esley told me all about it, and she wanted me to get involved. And so, I'm getting involved, and I'm in full support of it. So, um, I would say that this this disability that I have, it would have to be um, feeling um, anxious and, and the um, the anxiety, and and also and also due due to the um, le learn learning skills learning skills that I developed throughout my um or the learning skills throughout throughout my time because I found out that I was. Um, you know, attending special ed classes um, throughout my uh, time from the fifth grade to the um, seventh, fifth grade to the uh, seventh grade, and that's about it. You know, um, anxiety, uh, anxiety, a little bit of depression, and then just uh, the, um, the the learning skills, and that's about it. Thank you. Is that that's everyone, right? Oh, I'll go. 
Oh. My name is Matthew. I am a member of DAC. I have high functioning autism. Despite the name, I am low on the spectrum. Long story short, I need things spelled out for me a lot of the time. So you gotta be very specific with instructions. Thank you all for being so open. Um, and we're going to get things started with Esli. Um, so I want to know, is there a cure for your disability? Um, so from what I know and from what the doctor has told me, there's no care for retinitis pigmentosa, but there are um, certain eye conditions that can be um, kind of corrected, which means like they could maybe like if they have a lazy eye, they could fix that or uh, there's just different type of things they could do. I I personally don't know too much about that. Um, I just mainly know about my eye condition, but I don't. There's no cure currently, but there are um, some glasses uh, that are called IRA that uh, blind and visually people can use. I think it's a certain amount of uh, money. I don't know how much it is, but basically they put on these glasses and like a side and helps them and they lead and they like guide them to do different tasks. So I feel like that could be something that helps, but it's not so much a cure. So that's my answer. Thank you for your answer. So um, thinking about your sleeping patterns, what do your dreams look like? Are they in color? Do you think your imagination fills in things that you may have never seen before? Um, so when I was younger, um, I used to have uh, a lot more sight. I actually could see pretty well. I would ride a bike. I would uh, do sports and a lot of different things. Um, I still do, like I still can do that today, but I was just able to see a lot more um, when I was younger. So I feel like that's where it comes from. So currently now I actually uh, see in my dreams, like I, I see like if I had no visual impairment and I find that really cool. And then I also, um, I don't even use a cane or anything. Um, I just like walk around <laughs> like everyone else. But yeah, I actually see like like uh, very clear and like if I was able to see it, everything in my dreams. Um, there are times though, at least recently, um, I know my vision's been kind of like actually decreasing in the last like year or so. Um, at times there have been dreams where I don't see um, as clear but um, I just find it interesting that it's only been very few times for the most part I, I can actually see in my dreams. That is really interesting. Mm -hmm. What type of devices or technology do you use to help you? Um, so I use my phone. Um, I have an iPhone, um, iPhone, iPhone SE. And it has um, all, all the iPhones, I believe, have this after like the fourth generation, I believe. Uh, it has a screen reader called VoiceOver. And all you do is go to your settings and then accessibility and uh, you'll see VoiceOver. And that's what I use. That's how I use uh, my phone to text and things like that. Uh, text, email and everything and make phone calls and go on social media and watch videos and stuff. Um, and then I also use a computer. Um, my laptop, it has two screen readers. There's one called JAWS and another one called NVDA. And both of them are just, they're just two different screen readers that work for different things. And um, they uh, speak to me on everything that I do on the computer. And I actually use the computer by just using the keyboard. I don't even use the mouse so I use different commands to navigate the computer um, so I use those and then I also consider um, my me and my cane it's is an assistive tech uh, tech because it helps me like with traveling outside and things like that um, so I use that and then um, a brailler 
um, from time to time. Not so much anymore. I don't use it as often because a lot of, I mean, there's a lot more work we get in college, but I still use my Braille typewriter from, um, from time to time. For the most part, that's pretty much what I use. Awesome. From a perspective <laughs> of a blind person, what are your thoughts on the world's obsession with image and how people view themselves? Uh, um, this is interesting because, uh, like I said, when I was younger, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was younger, I was able to see um, a lot more. So, like, I know how, uh, well, like, for example, like, I use eye contact. I, I look at people when I, when I speak to them, and um, people get confused, um, and they kind of correlate that with like, like if you if I look at them, then they, they then they think I can see, and that's not the case. And I feel like that goes along with the whole like, you have to look a certain way, like you have to like I've gotten so many I've gotten people who say like, oh you don't look blind or you don't look like you can't see, and I never really understood that like how are you supposed to look like it goes for anyone with this disability like how are you supposed to, you're not supposed to look a certain way to have a disability um so that's how I look at that and then also like um when it comes to like just I don't know how how people dress or just even like um skin color and things like that I I I don't really understand why people are so focused on how people look at each like how people use different things like that just how people look and um make a like an assumption or something like that um but yeah I definitely like I I don't I understand it, but to a point, like, especially the whole part with disability, like, people have often told me, like, you can't see, um, so why are you, like, you're able to, like, you're looking straight at me as I'm talking to you, or you're looking straight at the screen, like, for example, like, I use my computer, or, like, right now, I'm even on the phone, and I look straight at the screen, but I really can't even, <laughs> like, I'm holding the phone in front of me, and I can't even see it in front of me, I just no, it's there so that yeah that, i hope that answers it that's pretty much it did um you touched on your braille or earlier that you use so are you able to read braille and if so how long did it take you to learn it yeah i can read braille um i started learning originally in middle school um i believe sixth or seventh grade and that's actually because um, that's when my vision actually started deteriorating to the point where it was getting harder for me to read regular print and um, and different things like that. Um, so I, I was introduced introduced to Braille then, um, but I was still able to use like mag magnification and um, different magnification devices and um, large print. So instead of the regular print, I think it's like a size 45 or something like that and then graduated um as, as I was getting older it gradually would get bigger so eventually like I realized that braille was going to be easier because it was just easier to read um the braille by touch rather than having to <laughs> to strain my eyes um so yeah I originally started learning in middle school and then um I think because Braille is like, it's, it's, um, there's six dots in Braille and they all like, um, you kind of like put different dots together to make different symbols and letters and numbers and things like that. And, um, because I was inter introduced to it in middle school, um, I was also in school. So I had classes and things like that. So I was, um concentrated on that and then eventually in high school I kept learning it and then from there I I um 
I learned the whole Braille code basically, and now I can say I I read it fairly well, but I definitely type it faster than I read. I'm not like one of those super speedy Braille readers. Gotcha. And last but certainly not least, does your condition cause you any pain? Um. So um. As for like me using the site that I have, um, at times it can hurt, it can strain my eyes, not so much like hurt it to like where it's like so much painful, it's just kind of strains, just like everyone, like I know people have told me like they look at a screen all day, their eyes kind of start to hurt, so it's pretty much like that, but I will say like I, my eyes definitely do get tired faster um and then like i said with the light it's 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 kind of like interesting to me because i need the light to see but then sometimes too much light it actually ends up hurting my eyes later um and occasionally from time to time i get not so much migraines but i just get random headaches just because of the too much light or always like trying to use the site that I have because that's the thing that I don't think people realize like because I have a little bit of sight I do try to use it from, from time to time like to see a picture for example or a video or to even see like uh, colors and things like that I really do try to look at it as as much as I can because I really am grateful and I appreciate the little sight that I have and sometimes I could I, I do it so much that it ends up straining my eyes. But that's pretty much the only pain I get, that my eyes get strained from time to time. And that okay. is- Okay, thank you so much. Esley, I think we have a question from Keith. Okay. Yeah, I actually have two requests. I have a question, but, but I have a preference to say, can someone give me the 30 second elevator speech on what the Disability Awareness Club does or is? Yeah, I can. Um, okay. So we actually um, try to, we provide uh, people awareness to um, disability. So for JJC, uh, we, for our like general meetings, we try to talk about anything pertaining to disability. Like we usually have a disability of the day or uh, any topic on disability. Um, and then we try to just uh, spread disability awareness on, on campus by doing different events um, or just having our, our meetings where we uh, speak just different topics on disability or if anyone ever has an issue or uh, anything that they want to talk about regarding disability, we, we basically talk about that. Okay, anybody else would like to illuminate? And then we also do a couple of fundraisers like Polar Plunge, mm -hmm. um, like, um, and then, um, we sometimes go to uh, the lake um, also um, and also um, do a fundraiser there and um, just any type fundraisers we um, like set up a dance or something and we do um, dances and also we um, we um, incorporate other clubs too with our mm -hmm. club like latino sonidos mm -hmm. and um so and their their clubs so we kind of mix them together and we're usually sometimes a big group excellent wonderful thank you that's great to know the reason i asked is because fc had sent me a uh a form that I didn't get a chance to fill out. So I didn't know if my next question was gonna be one that I should ask in this forum. Yeah, that's, that's sort of fine. Yeah, cause I saw him ask her a bunch of questions. So was I supposed to submit a question specific to her or is it okay if I just ask? 
the question. It's okay if you just ask. Okay. Okay. So I, 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 thanks for that information, both of you guys. It was totally illuminating. And uh, I think I've attended a couple of your meetings, or your, your events. Actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it was like you might have had a fashion show a couple of times. And then yeah. down at the beach, I've attended that, right, Ashley? Yeah. Yeah. So my biggest <laughs> concern and, and desire for my granddaughter, this is personal. Yes. And it might be for you guys as well is I want her to be independent. I want, yeah, her, yeah, I want her to be able to live her life fully, to meet a young man, to marry, to move yeah. into a home with him. And so is there any way that the group helps facilitate that? <laughs> not the beating of the boyfriend or that. that that's, that's, not, that's, yeah. that's not what I'm asking. I'm we, asking about being independent, like being able to get on a bus, go from home to downtown, get on a train, <laughs> get on a plane. Does the group help facilitate that at all? That's my question. Yeah, um, we talk about those things too. Um, we we talk about the pace bus or any other um, buses that are, if we wanted to go somewhere we had to um form everything in time and um yes we do talk about normal things finding um a person that you see yourself with and um it's sometimes it's sometimes hard because um you don't know what they're gonna say to you or um, you don't know um, what you want to say to them and how they're going to react because they just see you, most of people just see you as a friend and stuff like that. But um, we, um, we try to incorporate those things too. Yeah, and I'll chime in here too. I think any college student, regardless of disability, is trying to figure out their independence as they move on past high school and into college. So that's normal. Yeah. This group is, I think, I hope that this group is empowering students, spreading awareness, and advocating for the disability community both on campus and abroad. So by doing some of those things indirectly, it helps um, our students and our club members grow um, and pursue their independence as they proceed through college. So yep. I believe Javon has a question. And then we're going to have to get to our next panelist. Yeah. OK, well, first of all, hello, everybody again um, in the I'm going to keep my camera off because I'm in a place where actually and you probably can't see my face anyway because the sun reflecting anyway. But um, I do um, I have a question I, and I would like to, um, um, for Ethley to dive more into looks. And the question that I have for you is, what is your idea of beautiful? Uh, what is your idea of, like, I'm not, not, I mean, of course, I mean, and not, not just not, uh, not on the inside, you know, because I mean, what I'm on the outside, like how, how, what to you, what, what's, what, when you put on clothes in the morning and, you know, brush your hair and whatnot, what is it that qualifies you being beautiful to you? What does it, what does it look like? What do you think? Like, oh, this makes me look, oh, I, look, I like the bomb. Dot com. Um, well, actually, like, <clears throat> from that point of view, I get, like, ideas from, like, my sister or my mom or uh, my friends who are girls and things like that, or even my brothers, actually. Um. They give me like advice on what looks good and like what's kind of like what's in i guess like what's trending or something um but like in terms what's of what's like, on fleek this month yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of like um l like me looking beautiful i basically like uh i feel it like basically like when I brush my hair it's it's kind of weird because like when I brush my hair and I have it down um I 
it feels more natural to me. And then when I have it up, um, it still feels okay, but it just feels like I don't have my, like my hair is messy or something. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but uh, like with things that I wear, um, I like to feel comfortable, but then also like make sure that it looks nice. Um, it also like it also goes with like shoes and things like that too. Like I like for myself to basically feel comfortable and then um, like get advice from like my family members and friends that I trust. Basically, I, I think that's what you're asking. I always give her compliments. She always yeah, looks good. Yeah, because that's a nice blue shirt there. Like look, it's like so you you decide so for the record. Being um, that uh, you like say, hey, I like this shirt, and I want do you do you look at it by not just the color, but was it by the fabric or by how it yeah. feels on you yeah. when it when you yeah. Actually, yeah, I go by the texture. Certain textures I like more than others. Uh, sorry, that's my dog. Certain textures I like more than others, like uh, maybe oh. like softer or uh, um less yeah like less rough or something like that and then yeah my favorite color is actually blue um and it's one of the colors that i can see pretty well so i i have like uh, a lot of blue shirts to be honest um but yeah i also use the little bit of color that i can see as well at times i think let asley this is margo i think you act like you feel beautiful like when you're dancing so yeah. like um, he said when you went, he went to the fashion show, like when you guys were dancing at the games or you were like modeling in the fashion show, you walked like you felt beautiful. Like you just carried yourself that way. So if anybody yeah. else saw her at that fashion show, that's yep. what I wanted to say. Yeah. And that is true. Like when I'm dancing or something like that, I feel that way as well. I feel like free <laughs> too. And she's a good dancer. Yeah, so Thank you. Ashley, you see all the guys smiling, by the way. <laughs> so, awesome. Thank you for that question, uh, Jovan. Um, so we're going to move on to Juan, <laughs> if everyone's okay with that. Um, so my first question for you is, what do you consider a benefit of having CP? In other words, what do you feel would be different if you didn't have it? Um, what benefit to me with my disability? Um, well, I see, I see, I say I see things in a different light because um, I am a good listener. Um, I don't, um, I don't criticize people. Um, People always come to me, uh, just just a ear to listen to about their problems, about their successes, about their good days and bad days. That's also a benefit for me. And also, um, if I didn't have it, I probably want to be more involved. I would probably be out all days of the night and never come home until way late in the morning. Um, yeah, so. You have such a positive attitude and are so independent. What advice do you have for a younger person with a similar diagnosis? A similar diagnosis? Um, well, I would say Keep your hands up. keep your head up. Um, you're um, a special um, person and also a unique person. Um, and also, um, just never give up and keep reaching your goals, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. Thank awesome. You, Thank you, Uh What do you, what I want to know is how do you keep a smile on your face despite what's going on? Because 
the positive attitude is so infectious. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. But I'm just like any other person. I have my good days and I have my bad days. But the reason how I keep my spirits up and my smile is that I say to myself, well, it could have been it could have been worse. I could be not able to really talk to you uh, in the screen and um, I probably wouldn't be able to move my body at all. And I would uh, stuff like that because there are people are worse off than me. People that have to um, eat with um, a tube and I'm blessed that I could um, eat with my hands and um, do most things that other people do. But also it's, it's challenging sometimes because I have to work 10 times harder than others. But you got to do what you got to do. Oh, That's such an amazing outlook. Um, is your speech impaired? If so, do you use any of the new technology to communicate with others? Um, my speech is not impaired, but I, um, when I um, talk uh, with people, um, sometimes I hyperventilate, but, um, but I could understand and also really communicate with you. And I use, um, like, like Ashley, I use um, voiceover to read my text messages and stuff like that, or I use uh, Siri. I say, hey Siri, a lot. <laughs> I love that feature. Uh, Juan, lastly but not least, uh, I would like to know if you are in any pain at all, and if so, if you feel comfortable sharing. Um, I don't feel any pain, thank the Lord, but um, but I do get hurt, and I feel it, and that's a good sign for me because there, there are people out there that get hurt and don't feel anything at all, and that means my body still feels things, and um, I could, um, when I sit for too long, my body tells me, you gotta do some sit-ups or um, push off your wheelchair so you could relieve some butt pressure. But as I, um, do I get um, pain? Um, just if I hurt myself, but other than that, no. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Emily, um, if it's okay, um, I think we're headed to you next. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us what your disability is? Yes, sorry, I apologize for running late to the meeting. Um, I had an exam, but my name is um, Emily Selva and my disability, um, I'm, I have autism spectrum disorder. Okay, so my question is, what can I do to help a child with autism learn effectively in the classroom? Can you think of any techniques that may assist me? And how do I prevent a meltdown because the child may get frustrated? Um, for the first part of the question, for the techniques, I would recommend, based on how it was in my childhood, um, is that like to not give up on the child even if they are refusing to not learn or cooperate it is important that they still learn because when I was younger like my mom would always push me to do well in school and not give up um 
even though I know like it was hard with my disability throughout like my whole entire school but or it was just like hard throughout like the time I was in like school but and then for the meltdowns I would suggest or like techniques I would say um for a child um like a weighted blanket helps especially with calming down their nerves and as well as giving them space away like kind of like not like I like kind of like isolated but like kind of like not like getting like leaving them alone so that they can have time to calm down thank you for that what helps you to meet new people do you get nervous in new environments and if so what helps you feel comfortable um like based on how I've met people a lot of the times how I've met people is like basically friends of friends and kind of the reason of that is because like a lot of them like my friends have similar friends that are similar to them so it's kind of like people that I can get along with have a conversation with so that kind of makes it easier but at the same time I do get nervous in social situations especially if I don't know someone but then at the same time I try to be myself and not try to be someone I'm not and just be friendly I feel that on a spiritual level. What is one thing that your experience taught you about autism that the world needs to know? Um, my experience is that based on like something that we will need to know is that autism comes in a spectrum and everyone has autism differently. And also there's like a misconception when it comes to people with autism not having feelings. And the truth is we do have feelings, except everyone shows it in a different way, whether someone's verbal or not verbal. And also when it comes to autism, like with boys and girls, it's completely different, um, especially because I'm not saying this is for everyone, but a lot of the times a lot of girls are misdiagnosed with autism or not diagnosed till later in their life. And I'm very glad that I did get my early diagnosis, but many other like girls and women out there like have not got their diagnosis yet or got it later. And I think that there's a misconception when it comes to that, especially when it comes to like girls having the tendency more to mask, which is basically like having more, like acting more neurotypical than like like kind of like not showing their autistic traits and that's kind of a big reason why girls are underdiagnosed but I would say that's it for that question yeah um so kind of similar to the first the previous question if there was one thing you would like everyone to know about autism what would it be um, that we all work in different ways, especially when it comes to like our brain, the way our brain works is different, but at the same time, that's what makes us unique. And that's what makes us like, how do I say this? Like basically like, even though this does affect us for the rest of our life, like it autism doesn't go away. But at the same time, like, I still want to, like, be able to use, like, to help others, especially because I'm grateful that my autism is not as severe because I was more severe when I was younger. But at time, like, throughout time, it has improved. So I would say that nothing's impossible. Anyone, autism can do anything, achieve whatever goal go to school, college, or getting a job and things like that. This is a loaded question, so take your time. How do you feel about representation of the autistic community in the media? Um, I feel like there isn't enough representation because I feel like a lot of people don't really understand what autism is. 
And if they do, they might just assume that it's a certain way, like when it comes to like the more severe autism, like when it comes to nonverbal or just like like younger, like for example, like they might think that only boys have autism and things like that. But in reality, also girls have autism as well. Or, but also when it comes to that, like especially with like the new movie that just came out, the music movie and how that was just a bad representation of people that had autism, um, especially because like the person that did play the main role like of having autism was actually not autistic. So just thinking that like the way they were acting in the, in the movie was just not a good representation, kind of exaggerating what autism is but not understanding like everyone's different in a way. So I would say the media does need to do better in um, the portrayal of autism. I 100% agree. Lastly, but certainly not least, I would like to know if you can get better over time when it comes to autism. Um, it depends on the person because some people can get better at time, but some don't get better in time. But from my life, I would say, like, based on where I was back when I was two years old, it would say that I have gotten better because I was nonverbal at 18 months. And that's how my parents, like, were concerned that I possibly could have autism. And throughout my, like, preschool, I did, like, throughout early childhood, I did a lot of therapy and throughout all of like preschool and then elementary school with speech and social, like like working with a social worker throughout middle school, high school, and also doing speech. And then like just progressing over time. I was like in small classes, like I was in fundamental classes in math throughout middle school and high school. But for the rest of the classes, I was able to be in a regular classroom with the other so I think that I was able to progress and now to this day I'm in college so I think definitely for me it did get better over time but I still have my struggles here and there but at the same time like I'm grateful that I did improve when it comes to like I can actually speak and use my voice. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Emily. Your story is so inspiring. And thank you for continuing to inspire everyone every day. I'm going to move on to Erica, if that's OK. Uh, my first question for you is, have there ever been times where people didn't believe you that you have ADHD or a vision condition? And if so, how was that like and how did you deal with it? OK, so I would say uh, yes to a certain point. So I consider myself to have an invisible disability because I don't wear um, leg and hand braces anymore. I used to when I was in elementary school, but by the time I got to middle school, I guess I didn't like to like look different with my braces and everything. So I decided to stop wearing those. And also at first glance, I look like a typical college student now. And I have been running competitively since fifth grade. So I guess when you look at that, if I told people like my actual story, then they might be like, oh, did you really have a stroke when you're born? Do you really have a visual impairment? Because I'm able to do so many things and I don't openly disclose my condition to many people. So I don't really explain it and I'm not put in that situation of whether or not I actually have a disability. Thank you. Can you tell us more about support systems and services that have benefited you the most, both in high school and college? Yes. So in high school, I didn't really use many support services and I had a 504 accommodations plan and just communicated with my teachers when I needed something. I also had um, extended time for my SAT. And one accommodation that I do, I did use and I did use in college when we were in person is always sitting in the front of the classroom on the left side so that like the, the vision I do have 
I could see the board and the teacher, and also because I'm short, I needed to sit in the front. Um, and in college, I only used extended testing time for longer exams, as well as when tests are moved online because I type one handed and I get hand cramps sometimes when I write because I write so quickly with my right hand that then my left hand gets tight as I'm writing. OK, so is there any medication that may help? With your disability? Uh, and I believe the OK, so I'm going to start off with saying I was born um, eight weeks early and I weighed three pounds and one ounce. And then my first uh, ultrasound of my brain came back clear. But then when I got the second one when I was two days old is when I was diagnosed with having a neonatal stroke and uh, a neonatal stroke or a pediatric cerebral palsy. Pediatric stroke is considered a form of cerebral palsy. It's more on the mild side, though. Um, and my parents and my ophthalmologist knew that I had a left visual field neglect, uh, but I was diagnosed with left hemonymous hemianopsia at 14 years old after completing a visual field test. So this is similar to the one that you do at the driver's license facility to um, see what vision you have. And so this is a more thorough exam and that it showed that I could not see on the left side of both of my eyes. And I was diagnosed with, wait, hold on, I'm sorry, the wrong question. Oh yeah, I'm writing the right question. Okay, um, so I was diagnosed with ADHD in fourth grade, and there are not many ways to prevent neonatal or pediatric stroke, but sometimes it comes as a result of like certain injuries, or if you have something wrong in your brain, or history of blood clots, or it depends on your um, medical history of your family. Got it. How does this affect your everyday activity? OK, so first off, since I'm of age to drive, um, I do not meet the legally required amount of vision to obtain a driver's license, so I cannot drive a car. Most people with homonymous hemianopsia are unable to drive, regardless of whether it's the left side or the right side affected, affected because it is unsafe. And I am reliant upon my parents to take me places. And uh, currently, I'm working on getting a bus that can come pick me up at my house and take me to school or something. But the bus system in my town, it works, but it's not very convenient to where I need to go. I have about 50% use of my left hand, so I am completely reliant on my right hand to write and complete daily life tasks. So if I were ever to injure my right hand, I would have quite an issue of to take care of myself. And stroke also affected my arm and my hand, my arm and my hand more than my left leg. Got it. And lastly, but not least, how do you stay focused in the span of your ADHD? So I took medication for my ADHD for about 10 years, uh, starting in around fourth or fifth grade. But then I stopped a couple of months ago due to some circulation issues in my feet. And I guess I just use motivation and goals to help me get assignments done. And the only way I can explain this is when I was in eighth grade, I had to take the testing to see what classes I'd be placed into high school. And I was placed in regular classes with some um, like teacher's aides to help me uh, in school. And then starting like sophomore year, I wanted to move up to more challenging classes. So I would use motivation to like get my schoolwork done and be motivated that like I could achieve my goals if I moved up in classes and worked hard and got the grades. I needed to like, not to prove people wrong, but to a certain point that like, I can do this, I can be successful in school. Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing with us today. Thank and you. we're going to move on to Sarah, if that's all right. Um, um, I, had a, I had a question that oh. I typed in, I don't know if you saw it, but it was to Erica. Do you see it, you guys? I did see it, yeah. Okay. And I, you, you had talked about you, you couldn't drive, so I wondered, did you hear about these new e-bikes that they have? They can go pretty far. Yeah, I have not, but I'd have to look into it and see. You'll what... love it. You'll love it. <laughs> Thank You'll, you for sharing. You will love it. <laughs> Most of you guys I... will love it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had two questions, one from Jovan and one from Ashley. Ladies first. 
Uh, okay, I'll go then. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, if I can hear you. Okay, so I have, um, full disclosure, I have ADHD along with my visual impairment, uh, glaucoma, and um, I have one eye. My left eye is a nuclear. They, they took it out when I was 16. Um, and I just wanted to actually thank you um, for that answer because I, I've, um, I'm, this is what I'm struggling with in my adult life. Because um, ADHD was not a problem when I was younger, but when I got old, as I'm getting older, the focusing and the and um, everything that's traveling through my head seems to get, you know, speed up. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say thank you, and you're greatly appreciated for um, you know all, all of you that are being very open, Juan, and stuff like that. And I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but I just want to thank you right here and right now, just in case you know I forget. So thank you. Thank personally. you, Jovan. And Ashley, you have a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. OK, um, I was just thinking because I know you don't use a cane or anything. Is there mm -hmm. ever time where people uh, don't believe that you have that visual impairment? And like, what what do you do? Well, I would say yes, because I don't like openly share it. And I'm like used to well, I've gotten so since I was diagnosed later on, like I got used to moving my head to like look around. And that's why I think I don't really notice like my visual impairment on the right eye. I mean, I notice it on the left eye because that's the peripheral vision. But yeah. um, I guess I do. I just don't explain it a lot. So I probably need to start those so people know in case I run into them or don't see them. It's kind of important. But yeah, yeah I was just thinking about that because I know like mm -hmm. I use my cane, but if I don't use it, then people get confused. So, thank you. Does anyone have any plus, other questions for Erica? Plus, you guys need to know that Ashley uses her cane as a weapon periodically <laughs> 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 to <Some> clear space. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. And I think we are moving on to Sarah now. So, Sarah, my first question for you is what is something that has happened in your life that you feel is a benefit that relates to having neurofibromatosis? I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. You actually pronounced it perfectly. For me, it took me a really long time to come to grips with that I had a disability that not many people have that I've never met anybody else with it. So a positive thing that's come out for me, I've become a very big advocate for people with invisible disabilities because I have been told by teachers in high school that your disability is not real. You don't have it. You're confused. You have ADHD. You have autism. So it's really gotten me to want to be a voice for those who can't speak on, speak for themselves or are too afraid to stand up because I am someone who will speak my mind no matter what. Like, if you are being offensive, I will let you know. I do not hold back. I absolutely love that. Will you continue to need surgeries in the future? Is there a way to get rid of the tumors altogether? Medicines? Can you tell us how this affects your life on a daily basis that people may or may not think about or relate to? Yeah, so there sadly is no cure for NF, no medicines I can take, and I will continue to need surgeries. And the way it affects me in my daily life is I have uh, bad joints in my knees, which kind of affected me because I was a big like walker. I love to walk my dogs, and in my hands I'm starting to get kind of like arthritis, carpal tunnel, and I am a graphic design major, which is kind of hurting my ability to do that because I can't sit and draw as long as I used to. And with the surgeries I need, they do leave scars and the ones I need to get removed tend to pop up on places that my clothing really doesn't cover. Like I used to never wear shirts that would show a little bit of my chest because I do have a scar there. I have a very large scar on my back, one across my stomach. So it kind of affects how I see myself that I don't think I'm as pretty as I was before I started getting these removed. And it makes me think, 
do I want them to be painful and avoid scars or have scars and not have that pain? Got it. What was it like discovering you had your disability? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I was diagnosed when I was, I believe in fourth grade and I really didn't understand what was wrong with me. I just thought I was kind of a quirky kid. As I grew older and I started asking more questions, I understood it more. Once I hit high school, I was like, yes, I have NF. I have problems with my joints. I don't grasp math and science as fast as everybody else. I learn very differently. So it was kind of difficult because it's something that you don't understand. It's not as common. You can't like research it as much. There's information out there, but there's not a lot since there are two different kinds and I am on the very low end of NF1. So when I was in high school and really started to kind of, I guess that's when I realized I had a disability. It was hard for me because I wasn't like my friends. I was always in the math class for kids who didn't like grasp it as quickly. I might, when I didn't understand something like my friends, I felt, I felt stupid. Like, how do I not understand this? People my age are able to do these things and I can. I clearly saw something was wrong, but once I hit my senior year, I kind of embraced it that this is who I am. I'm not going to be able to get rid of my NF if I just ignore it. I started talking about it more and kind of letting people know, like, this is real and it's something that isn't really known about. I understand. Have you ever met anyone else that has NF? I've never met anybody personally. Like, I don't have any friends that have NF, but I started doing great steps for NF walks in the summer in Naperville. So I got to go and see kids my age with NF, adults to see like this could be like my future, like they are like living their own lives. So there is hope that I can be a successful adult and little kids with it, just seeing them starting to learn that they've got a disability. So I've met people, but I don't like personally know anybody with NF. What is something that has happened in your life that you feel is a benefit that relates to having NF? I think a benefit is just being more aware that I could have been born with a more severe case of NF1 or a more severe case. I could have had NF2 and I could have been more disabled than I am. And it, it's also being come aware to me a benefit that I never really wanted children, but now knowing that I have NF, I have a very high chance of passing this on to my kids. So it's a benefit knowing that I'm able to have kids, but I've chosen not to, that it gives me the option knowing that like, now I have a reason to look into adoption, fostering and kind of helping out because I can't have kids of my own. That's amazing. Well, last but certainly not least, do you have a lot of pain and is there a cure for your disability? I do have pains in the tumors that grow, like when um, like high water pressure, like sometimes just even touch hurts, but there is no cure as of now. I know they are looking into seeing if there's something they can do to kind of like destroy the gene that NF has or like medicines for it. I know there's been trials, but since I am 21, I'm not in that age bracket for it. But I'm hoping there is some cure for this. So there's NF can be kind of wiped out. So no one has to go through what we go through. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I appreciate you. your transparency. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Otis. Um, so, Otis, how can you tell if you're 
the stability is kicking in and what do you do about it? Like, for example, if you're having a test and you start to feel anxious, how do you deal with it? He's on mute. I don't know if he knows he's on mute. Oh, gotcha. Otis, are you there? I think you're on mute and your camera is turned off. Maybe. Well, while we wait, I have a question for Sarah, actually. Okay. Um, and while we wait, uh, Sarah, what is the one thing in life that annoys you? I don't know. I don't know. You might. I think you might have answered it actually in so many words and say because I think that a lot of questions that were asked kind of, you know, it, it sweeps along this question because a lot of us um, with disabilities we kind of go through the same type of stuff but as far as like as a as a person with uh is it neurofibromatosis is that, is that how it's pronounced hello sarah yeah, are you she's, there? On mute. she's on mute too so i think you're correct with the pronunciation I think okay well, the question that I have um, is, um, what is what what is the one thing that that annoys you while having this uh, disability? What's the one thing that gets to you? Is this question for me? Sorry, I had to step away for a moment. It is for you. It's for Sarah. Something that annoys me is people not believing that it's a real disability because they haven't heard of it. Ah. You wouldn't tell somebody who's blind that you don't have that disability. You, you don't. You don't look like you have it. <laughs> I had a teacher tell me that in high school that I didn't have it. I'm like, I have documentation. Like, oh, well, I, I think you were misdiagnosed. I'm like, I wasn't. I see one of the top neurologists for NF in the country. I wasn't mm. misdiagnosed. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I, I <laughs> I think we, I think yeah, I understand that actually. I think that uh, uh we, I, I walk in with a cane and like, are you sure you're blind? Like, no, I'm not sure at all. I, I'm just, I just happen to just reach in the air and this is a pole of Moses. I'm trying to part the Red Sea and let the people go. So I understand perfectly what you mean. I like that answer. I like that yeah, answer. I should use that too. That's a good one. Staff of Moses. Sorry, but I'm gonna be proper. <laughs> You know, I got a question, uh, guys, as someone who's supposed to be normal. If, can I ask you guys all a question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So my oh. biggest problem I have is anger. So I, I'm anger. assuming that there are times that you guys get angry at family members, uh, fellow friends, people in general. Ooh. Is that yes. something that you guys are able to deal with? Uh, is this well, for the panel or is this for everybody else? Everybody. everybody. <laughs> can I can I can I can I jump? <laughs> yes. You know, I, I I've kind of <laughs> um I I've, I've learned throughout the 35 years of life that I've lived that an argument if you if you're arguing you said too much. <laughs> First of all, um I think that in some sense as I got as when I was younger the anger was more apparent because they didn't understand that I was visually impaired and you know, you got to because I, I would go to school and get picked on four eyes and ugly and saying, oh, wow, you know, you can't see how many fingers are you holding up? And, you know, in, in being teased by children, not understood by teachers because they think that you they, they think that, oh, you have one disability. So therefore, it must affect your brain. You know how many people I take a lot of bright, if I, my, I, you know, I got a lot of blind friends because we're in this, uh, you know, we are we, we're, it's a population that is small so you know we all know each other so I, we would go out and all of a sudden they were like well what would she be having I'm like i don't know you should ask her so we deal with all that then we got to come home to a family that we were born into and still have to explain to them 
that the disability is if they just was there, as if they were there yesterday. And the thing is, a lot of it growing up as kids, they, you know, like me as a kid, no, you know, I come home, you know, my sister is the only one that would play with me. And that's because she's my age. My brother thought I was embarrassing because he didn't know how to, you know, as, a, as, a, as him as a kid, he didn't know how to handle it. So a lot of that stuff do leave a lot of anger and emotional. It, it, it has a lot of anger and emotional resentment with that. But I, the, the way I learned to deal with it is just to, I guess, in some sense, take the uh, advice of Christ. In some sense, um, one of the biggest uh, and, and one of the biggest things he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Some people just don't know better. So, you know, even no matter how much you think they should, and the more I thought that I, the more I kept thinking that they should know better, the matter I got. So the, the less I start thinking, well, they just don't know better, it doesn't help with the anger. It's like, oh, well, you just don't know better, and let's move on. So that's that's my thought on it. Thanks. That's, that's true. And for me, with my disability and being CP, um, I'm mostly angry sometimes at myself because when I was younger um, I did not want to go to therapy I didn't want to do any of the exercise but as I got older um, I had to um, realize that I had to use my body more and, and then my upper body more than my lower body um and i was pretty angry at myself because um i would go back to, in time uh, and tell my li li little self that you need to work harder more and probably would have been walking with crutches and stuff like that um my big part of me was laziness and also um and also do i get mad at people um when they don't know things no um i get upset but i don't get mad um because they don't know better like um javon said and and um they give my mom some my parents some like sad looks I'm sorry for your son. I'm sorry that he's born this way. And they're like, why sorry? <laughs> he's just a normal guy, a normal man, a normal yeah, kid. Because, yeah. yeah, um, of course, my parents wanted the best for me. And they tried their hardest to give me a good life and they, they did succeed at that. Um, I, I would imagine that um, they wanted me to walk, but they're like, he's my son and I love him. And, um, and then my father tells me all the time, everything happens for a reason. And, um, you're everybody's special in their own way. And also, when we talk about disability, mm -hmm. I, w I would say everybody has a disability in some shape, type, or form. Nobody, normal, nobody's normal per se. Amen. <laughs> Here, here, All right. Well, you you guys, if if you guys want any of anybody else want to answer that question, I, I just wanted to ask that question because you guys do go through a lot of tests and trials and stuff, and and I could see that how things could become frustrated. Like uh, Sarah said, people didn't believe her, you know, and some people are just. Maybe don't want to discuss it and all of that. And you get tired of answering the question and all of that. But yeah. I want to tell you guys from just being here with you, and I'm not patronizing you in the slightest. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. That you guys are all special in your own right. And 
and that you inspire us who consider ourselves normal because it does take a lot. It even takes a lot for a family. I want to give your family's credit as well for helping and being there with you because I don't think that all people can help others or, or be there for them. So you can pat them on the back as well. So yep. thank you guys. Well, Keith, this is Margo, and I've actually Hi, been Asley's teacher and Juan's uh -huh. teacher, and I, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, um, I think the one thing that they don't brag enough about is their mm -hmm. sense of humor. They, mm -hmm. they are so understanding when people do boneheaded things <laughs> or say boneheaded stuff yeah. in the classroom. <laughs> and the other thing that I would, I, I have to kind of throw out is they are so ready to help someone else. Mm -hmm. It is the most incredible thing about you guys. You're always, mm -hmm. um, I always overcoming things, but the second somebody else needs help, oh, let me help, let me help. Mm -hmm. So I would have to say their sense of humor <laughs> and their ability to see themselves as leaders has mm -hmm. impressed me in the classroom. And I actually fight to have students with disabilities in my classroom. Esley, do I not stalk you? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. And I go to Juan and I go to like on dates practically. Yeah. Like the, and like Juan, I want to tell a Juan story. Uh, Juan is the biggest flirt on this panel. And you don't know that. You look at Juan, you think whatever. But like he'll sit in my classroom with like girls from other classes and he, oops, real sly, will drop his phone so all the girls <laughs> will run and pick it up. He's like, oh, can I read your palm? I read palms. So then he's holding their hand. I look over, I'm like, Juan's working the room again. So I, I think that sense of humor and like, at the at the fashion show, when I saw you guys helping each other and dancing, I had fun. So I think being around uh, you guys, two of your strengths that you don't know how you handle with frustration is your wonderful sense of humor and you're always willing to help someone else out. Like even being on this pan panel, Emily, I don't know you, but you're right. It is harder to be a girl with any kind of spectrum disorder. And my yeah. son deals with some stuff, but it's almost invisible. And then people are nasty. And I see you like, mm. let me talk and help people. And another invisible one was you, Sarah, like no one can see it. As a teacher, I want to apologize for your teacher. Your teacher is not a doctor. She shouldn't have tried to diagnose you. And I want to apologize for <laughs> That's your teacher. Right. That's true. That's so true. Otis. She said, she said yeah. Speaking of oh, disabilities that may be invisible, Otis still has to share uh, about anxiety. So, uh, are you ready to go? Yes, sir. All right. So, uh, before before we continue, uh, first and foremost, let me um, apologize for um, let me apologize for not uh, speaking. It's the uh, the, the microphone that was having like a static um, like a static okay. interruption. But I'm on my phone for now, so I'm still here. Okay. You're good. Sounds clear. No problem. Okay. How can you tell if your disability is kicking in, and what do you do about it? For example, like if you're taking a test and you start to feel anxious, how do you deal with it? Uh, that right there is a good question. So um, before before I answer that question, um, I found I found out I believe a month or two ago that um, that a mental illness counts as a disability, which anxiety is also a mental illness. So since that counts for since that also counts for disability, I say okay, okay, that that's like, that actually is true. So that does count for it. So, um, so, to, so to answer the, uh, the first question, how do I deal with it? The first time that I felt um, anxious was, I believe it was at the time when I was either in the eighth grade or in my freshman year of um, high school when it comes to taking certain um, tests. Because uh, around that time, I never got the um, extended, I never got the extended time, excuse me, throughout my, um, throughout my time in um, high school. And then, but as soon as I got to Joliet Junior College, they have the uh, testing center, which they allow um, extended testing time. But, but of course, throughout my uh, time at JJC, I always, of course, I do take take um, tests in the um, how do I say it? Yeah, I do take the um, the tests in the um, in the classroom. But then, if I needed like more time, like if I get confused with certain things, then yeah, I would definitely need, need more time to um, study. And then I would take the time out of my day to like pick a certain date for me that's that that's free for me. That way, I'd be able to take the test um, take the test more easier, like like more easier for me. So that's how. You know, anxiety kicks in, but as soon as as soon as you tell yourself, "Hey, just believe in yourself," you know, believe in the abilities that that, that you that that you have in order to um, overcome whatever it is that you're uh, taking, no matter what test it is, whether it's school or just life. 
Do your best. What techniques have you learned to help you better understand your anxiety? Um, I haven't. Uh, let me let me think. Actually, I have learned I have learned a lot, but there, there's a few that I forgot. But I, I can I can tell you what I remember. The one thing that I remember the uh, the techniques that I learned about um the uh, learn about the anxiety that I have is that is that you, you you're gonna get uh, nervous when it comes to doing either something doing doing something for the first time or doing something that you feel that like you're not gonna do a, a great job on, and that's what that nervousness uh, kicks in because I because grow, growing up. Uh, years ago, this is back when I was a teenager. I would always think that being nervous is, is a um, it's like a some kind of bad thing or whatever. But, but then as soon as around my senior year, I think, oh wait a minute, being nervous is actually an okay thing because that's how people uh, feel, and that is how people are gonna do when it comes to doing, you know, doing certain new uh, things when when it comes to stepping out of your comfort zone or when it comes to you know, um, just basically just to t- taking taking that test that that you have to take in order to pass this or pass that. So the other technique that I learned that when it comes to um, having, when it comes to having anxiety, then you're gonna feel like your um, body, you feel like your soul is gonna like completely leave your body. It feels like you're not physically, feels like you're not gonna be physically there. Like if it feels like you're on the brink of death, you know, the derealization, a sense of being out of someone's um, body, and it feels like when you're coming, when you're becoming a grown up, it feels like you don't know anything. But um, but in all actuality, you 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 are you're smarter than than what you uh, think. So. Um, so yeah, I feel like you know, because um, sometimes you know, it's more like accepting yourself, uh, who you are, whether you ha- whether you have it or not. For anybody that's going through anxiety and depression, just just know that um, yeah, just basically know that you are who you are, and yeah, you may be feeling the sense of uh, coming out of your um body like of your own, but but that but that doesn't mean that makes you that makes you um that 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 doesn't mean that you gotta doubt yourself. That doesn't mean that that you are below everybody else you know that 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 just means that you're taking this uh first step and then that's that's basically basically the new technique i learned you mentioned depression so what helps you with your anxiety and depression uh good question okay so let me be honest i do um i actually do love hearing that uh question because i have so many great amazing positive beautiful things that help me um that help me get over any, any depressed moods or help me get over my um my anxiety. So the first thing that, that helps me get over it would be um where the first thing that would help me get over it would be um it would be music and it would be talking to it would be talking to all to all of my uh to all of my uh, good friends, you know, like whether if I want to hear their stories or whether I want to hear their stories and then we end up feeling feeling so much better about um about life and everything. Mm-hmm. And so the other thing that will also help me, the other thing that will also help me uh get over it, it was to um talk to myself and say, hey, you or just look at myself in the mirror and say, "Hey, I know you've been through so much, but you, you just remember you, you are enough." And of course, your your parents and your family tell you this all the time too. Like whether you're feeling down, that that you are enough. It, to just let you know you, you're not, everybody's not perfect, and also to let you know you're just human and you just look the uh, to the fullest. And that's basically that's basically all you can do. So yeah, it's just. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, me living my life. You know, um, some great, some great music, including R and B and soul. That also helps me um, get get me in a, a better mood. Also, also just like a little bit of um, how do I say? Yeah, a little bit of a, a little bit of prayer. Like if I feel the need to, you know, talk to God because I am a I am a Christian. I'm a religious uh, person. And uh, I, and yeah, and yeah, that's basic. That's basically. Oh wait. Oh, as a matter of fact, let me um, add more to that. Sorry about that. Also, what else what also helps me get over anxiety and de- anxiety and depression is that when I try something new for the uh, first time, for example, um, during during my um oh yeah during my spring semester of uh, the spring semester back in 2017, for the first time ever, I attended a talent show, and I was performing a choreography in the song called uh, "Dangerous" by Michael Jackson. I thought I wasn't doing so good, but I felt that I did um, a great job, and that was that nervousness and anxiety that I had to um. That to like you know break through, and even though I didn't win, even though I didn't win, the the coach from the cheerleading team uh, spotted me and said, "Hey, do you want to join the team?" And I, and I was kind of having second thoughts on that one, but um, I wanted to step out of my comfort zone yet again and try something new yet again because that that right there was like another um mm-hmm. a, a, another footstep in the door to you know to be able to uh, try something new. Preach, that's awesome. Uh, last but not least. 
is there any medication that you take for your anxiety or can take? Um, for, um, if I, if I could be honest, there, there's no, uh, like pain medication that I'm like actually like, uh, taking, but like the only, but the, but the only things that, that I do take, like when it comes to having, um, headaches, I would take, you know, just Advil and, and almost, and almost every day, you know, ever since uh, COVID hit, I would take my, um, take, take my vitamin D. Yeah. E even, even around the time where, where I have to go to work, I would take vitamin D first before I leave the house. And, um, but but the um, but I would say that um, the meds that I that I would be uh, taking that will you know help me uh, get over the anxiety and depression would be um, some great uh, relaxing beautiful music and also with um, med meditation and also um, also um, I already said music my bad so meditation uh, praying uh, drawing and coloring and yeah it's ba ba basically basically all that and of course talking to friends but i would also like to have my like you know my alone time first before i you know talk with anybody but uh, i don't have my alone time fully but but just 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 to i would have like my alone time just just to just to get over whatever it is that i was feeling and then i will go back to the basics you know when it comes to uh, drawing and coloring and dancing music meditation and uh praying you know all of those has definitely um helped me get over uh depression anxiety oh i almost forgot to mention um therapy Cause I went to therapy um, a few times, like a few a few months ago. Even e even late last year, I went to uh, therapy as well to help me get over depressed moods and to help me get over the anxiety that, that I was feeling at the time. So that right there, that right there would be like my medication. That that right there would be like the most powerful uh, tool, the most powerful, beautiful tool, if I should say. I, I won't I won't say tool. As a matter of fact, powerful, beautiful. Um, just a powerful, beautiful admiration. And actually, the magic that was flowing, flowing through my body and flowing through my soul that can that helped me just uplift my uh, spirits in a way. Thank you, Otis. I think Keith has a question. Yeah, it's more of a statement actually because I know Otis. Uh, I uh, know his mom, and uh, we we talk together. And uh, I just want to say to you, Otis, thank you for being the person that you are. Uh, always giving of yourself. Um, I, you know, the last time I saw you, you were helping my granddaughter Ashley, and it was just an amazing thing to for you to be there to support her. Where people were mocking her because she was dancing. Remember the cheerleading, and you were there. Oh yes, and I forgot. I definitely forgot to mention that. Speaking of, yeah, I, thank thank you so much for reminding me. Um, speaking of cheerleading, um, you know. You know, when it comes to um, Esley and her visual impairment, you know, when it comes to joining uh, the cheerleading team or any sporting event, any anybody can uh, still join regardless of your disability, whether you have one or not. So, yeah, basically, I believed in, like, I believed in Esley so much that she got accepted into the team. And um, and, and with me, yeah, it was me and the other cheerleaders. It was it was it was ma mainly me that was um, helping her because she came to yeah. me the most. Yeah. So I helped her. I helped her out with the dance moves. She got it uh, down and. And then with through the uh, through the um, the halftime shows, she actually did a really great job. And it, it doesn't matter what the movements look like. She she still she still got it down because the um you know rather no matter what the dance movements look like, it was still the same way that we did it. So it really didn't have to be perfect. The, what what's most important is that she like completely nailed, nailed it right right off the bat. And I uh, just basically I just couldn't be uh, more proud of her what she what she accomplished and what she um done. You know the, throughout throughout her time with the cheerleading team. So that was. That, that that right there was like a um a blessing a blessing in disguise right there. I have to thank you for that, Otis, because you're a very good dance instructor, and it was like I said so many times, like it's amazing that you dance, but the fact that you're able to teach someone who can't really see what's going on, it was just amazing to see that. But I thank you for that because without your help, I wouldn't have been able to do uh, the dances as well. <laughs> And it made it more fun for me. So, thank you for that. So you guys are all beautiful people in your own right. right? And always remember that. Try to really. I know that it's got to be difficult for you. I'm going to tell you guys something that I uh, heard the president of a university say to the student, the new students on uh, orientation. I'm a black man, and we suffer. We go through disability. We go through prejudice. We go through a lot of trials and we get angry. My son and I laugh about the fact that, uh, you know, if we were to get angry at everything that was done against us racially, we'd go nuts. And so I imagine you guys go through things that 
people say to you harshly and unjustly. So the president said to the student body, which is, she went to Wheaton College, and it's primarily a white school, so not a lot of black children go there, but the ones who go there are pretty exceptional, and they have to take a lot of ridicule because they don't go to the black universities. So he gave this speech, and he said, I know you white students in here think that these black kids got into school, you, know, you guys have challenges as well, they got into Wheaton because of some, um, what do they call that, special? Affirmative action. Affirmative action. He says, I want you to know that that's not the case. I, and he says, I want you to know something else. He said that, and I enjoyed hearing this. He said, I want you, you guys probably think that they think that they're honored by being here because you're white and you're a white university. He says, on the contrary, you should be honored that they're here and you should try to learn from them. So I would say to you guys, I'm honored to have spent this time to get to know you guys, and I feel more blessed in getting to know you guys, and uh, I'll keep you in my heart and prayers. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm honored. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate coming. it. Keith. Does anyone have any other questions for our panelists? So thanks again, Otis. I, I didn't finish. I was saying to you that I really appreciated your being there and taking your time, the patience and the concern and consideration that you showed. And your 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 teacher's correct that you guys do go beyond and above and so say hello to your mother as well okay <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I got you thank you i want to thank all of our panelists for being here and being honest transparent and vulnerable with all of us you inspire me daily and i appreciate all of you and thank, thank you, you. We, we, we appreciate thank you. you too yeah, thank you and to anyone out there, never be afraid to ask because most of us are pretty open. Mm -hmm. Well, ask my granddaughter for dates. <laughs> <laughs> Since I know you got game one. <laughs> yes, he does. She does Maybe. too. Ashley's got game too. You oh, should see her all dressed up at the all fashion right. show, Keith. Yeah, Ashley's got her own game going on. I always ask her, Ashley, when am I going to meet that guy? I'm on He's got to be really I, special, I, Keith, to pass through all of us. He's got to be real special. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I actually know of a lady, and I wanted to sh leave this with you guys, that used to work with my boss. I mean, my wife, which is my boss. It's synonymous. <laughs> 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 Some of you guys are good. <laughs> you <Nope. laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, she worked for the lady who was blind. The lady was blind, and she took the Burlington Northern train, and that's why I asked that question, Leslie. She took yeah. the Burlington Northern train from uh, the town, let's just say it was Downs Grove, all the way to the city of Chicago, and walked to work every day on her own. And when she came home, she went back to her own abode. Okay? Totally blind. Yeah. So... That's what I want for you guys. Whatever you um, want, hey man, you'll 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 get there. You'll get there. Keep hanging in there. You'll get there. Yep. Whatever you do, you do your best. I used to coach girls fast pitch softball, and the only thing I wanted for my girls were to just be their best. I don't care if they were not the all star. Just be your best. Do your best, and then be be satisfied in that. If, if you can't do something, oh, well. There's lots of things I can't do. And also, never forget this. Um, always be humble and kind. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, before we sign off here, I'd like to, um, again, 
Great job to Mac on moderating, and yeah, then even more job. so, even, yeah, kudos to Mac on yeah. moderating, and even more kudos job, to, uh, and more kudos to our panelists who who were brave enough to, to sit up here. It is not easy to talk about yourself no matter what you're talking about, let alone some of these vulnerable topics, yeah. um, and, and really diving deep and, and sharing your experiences. So I give you guys a lot of credit takes a lot of courage um, and you're all doing great things. This is just one small tidbit and I'm glad we could host this event and kind of share your experiences. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to Mac for moderating. And I think yeah. we're about uh, ready to sign off unless okay. anybody else has any close, any more closing remarks. Mm -mm. All right, very good. I'm going to stop recording and then we'll share that. Um, thanks again, all. Thank you. Thank for you. Everyone. Thank you.